Recently, I was one of the founders of Earn.com, which we uh, sold to Coinbase earlier this year. Um, I've been in the crypto space for a number of years now, uh, and before that, did you know completely different things. Um, but uh, now, this is where I spend the majority of my time. Cool. I'm Eli Kadori, the founder of Intuition Machines, and we uh, recently launched a project called Age Capture, which actually tokenizes human labor for machine learning applications, which now has actually quite a lot of users. So. Hello, everyone. I'm Rune Christensen, and I am the co-founder and CEO of the Maker DAO project. And basically, we are one of the oldest and also one of the most used Ethereum uh, decentralized applications currently running. And we're doing, a, on one hand, a stable cryptocurrency that's decentralized and also that is powered by a decentralized credit network, all run on smart contracts on Ethereum. Thank you, guys. Um, so we'll start out with the fundamentals. Um, I want to ask a question, and that is, what does it mean that cryptocurrencies make money programmable? Uh, haven't we had digital cash before? Why is it di different this time around? Eli, do you want to start? Sure. So. Uh, cryptocurrencies are most often used as sort of a unit of exchange for value, but what they enable that cash you know, does not enable is to actually start moving portions of contract law into the, the exchange itself so that you now start to enforce programmatically these terms that otherwise would have to be litigated if there was a disagreement. Yeah, I think it's really critical also that this ability to program money and kind of like unlock advanced functionality is something that's available to everyone, right? Mm -hmm. It's like anyone with a computer, you can actually go and like code advanced smart contracts. Mm -hmm. OK, so accessibility is one, moving between projects as well. Lily, yeah. what are your um, thoughts? Well, you know, when, when I initially uh, heard about Bitcoin a number of years ago, I thought, oh, well, you know, didn't PayPal kind of do that as well. But once you dig into the surface, um, the, uh, the way it's implemented is actually really critical. Um, because even with something like PayPal, it seems like I'm just paying Suna. But in actuality, you essentially have a bank behind the scenes, which is providing that critical clearing kind of settlement function. Uh, and what you have with digital currency is because it's truly peer-to-peer -peer payments, um, you rely on, on sort of this network of computers, or this, uh, this network to sort of clear those transactions rather than centralized third party, right? So it essentially what it does is it takes that sort of critical function of ensuring you're not, du du uh, you're not double spending your money, which is the most important thing when it comes to money, uh, and, and sort of redistributing that sort of power back to all of the nodes in a network rather than the center. And that's really what is so critical about, uh, uh, about blockchain. It really takes sort of the, the trust and the power that's formerly um, vested in, you know, typically some central or collection of central parties, redistributes that amongst uh, the participants in a network, and that's really one of the most fundamental things that's, that's happening in blockchain. Absolutely. I do think one of the biggest critical points was our ability to avoid double spending. Um, outside of the technicals, what, and I love that you brought up PayPal before, what do cryptocurrencies bring to this ecosystem that the existing financial systems don't already? So um, I think, again, it's like the, the, really, like the really big difference is this accessibility, right? This like equal playing field where everyone has, has access to the most advanced stuff. So it's like, I think in many cases, a lot of the stuff you do with blockchain is stuff you could do without it. It's just that you cut down the cost, you cost that, cut down the barriers to entry. Um, and then there are also some situations right, where you open up completely novel use cases and completely new forms of, of transactions. 
Um, and then just ex one example, right, is with this, with our system, with um, the MakerDAO system. We enable like anyone, right, regular people to get access to, to essentially a repo desk service. So like a, like collateralized loans where you just directly pledge some collateral and then take take a loan instantly, right? Like without a middleman, without some sort of advanced process, you just use a smart contract directly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. So I think there's a number of um, really interesting new things you can do with it. Um, if you talk about uh, accessibility and inclusion, um, one of the sort of uh, less talked about features of cryptocurrency is a very simple one, is just that with an internet connection, you can instantly start to get uh, paid, right? If you just have an internet connection, a very simple computer it could be a phone. Uh, and that's very powerful because when you think about sort of the transactions on the internet, oftentimes we're putting money into services on the internet. But it's actually very hard to get paid out, and particularly very hard if you're trying to pay out you know, people in lots of different countries and potentially smaller, uh, smaller amounts, right? Uh, and so, you know, by, by sort of decreasing uh, that barrier, it actually sort of stimulates all sorts of new commerce. That's one. Uh, and then another is that uh, it enables things like, um, you know, streaming micropayments. Uh, and so, you know, for a long time, we've been thinking, you know, why can't a consumer of content pay directly the creator of that content? And there have been all these sort of uh, potential solutions that people have thought about over the years in order to do that. And yet again and again, we sort of fall back onto um, the modernization of the internet, which is really, you know, sort of you give your attention minutes of your time, and then someone pays for advertising and try to, uh, uh, and that's kind of the exchange that, that uh, we've been doing for about 20 years. Um, and so I think that with cryptocurrency, um, you know, it's maybe a little bit more on the horizon, but we're starting to see some really interesting uh, situations where a lot of uh, interesting experiments where people are starting to find ways to sort of directly clear that commerce. And I think that's going to be pretty interesting. Yeah, I mean, effectively, what is you know, blockchain? It's just an append-only database, right? So it enables things that reduce trust, it enables things that includes, that sort of increase verifiability. But fundamentally, the novel applications are often things that you could have built in some other way, and you are simply replacing a base layer to say, all right, we're going to get new abilities, we're going to get new um, certainty into the system, and that by itself will actually enable new applications. Got it. And so when you guys are thinking about the horizon 20 years out, are you thinking about cryptocurrencies as an asset class that replaces the existing fiat system? Do you see cryptocurrencies running in parallel with our existing system? Or what does the financial system 20 years out look like? Um, so I think about, um, I segment that by the different types of use cases that I think cryptocurrencies uh, can potentially fall into, right? Um, the original and one of the most popular ones is the sort of non-sovereign uh, monetary store of value, in other words, Bitcoin. Uh, and then there's you know, been a whole lot of innovation around these uh, distributed computing platforms, Ethereum being the first one, uh, and a lot of work being done in that area. So you know, ultimately, they do use a token. So I guess they all sort of fit into this, this class of cryptocurrencies, but they're actually wildly different in uh, how they're going to be used, what their purposes are, a number of use cases which are going to be built on top of them. Um, and so I think that uh, the, the case for a sort of non-sovereign monetary store of value is a very strong one, right? Uh, the simple narrative is digital gold, and I, I think that's something that sort of just broadly appeals and makes a lot of sense to people, uh, and in many ways is sort of even better at fulfilling the store of value uh, uh, goal than even you know, physical gold today. Mm -hmm. So I think that one is uh, around to stay, um, and I think that there's probably going to be a number of other um, a uh, number of other uh, applications of cryptocurrency that's probably going to come closer into our everyday lives. Uh, but I actually personally think that sort of digital fiat is probably going to be um, a sort of dominant uh, um, application probably within three to five years and beyond then. Uh, and so for me personally, I think that, you know, as much as there's talk about sort of Bitcoin replacing the international financial system, um, I think with countries having as sort of strong distribution as they do, and now also the interest in leveraging some of these aspects of cryptocurrency, that that at the end of the day is going to be um, a dominant part of our experience with cryptocurrency. Yeah, I think it's much more likely that in the next five to 10 years, what you'll see is blockchain technology being deployed within the existing system to make things more efficient where it makes sense. I'm going to say that in 20 years, it's quite plausible that things will be fast enough that we can use these technologies for many more applications 
but at least in the short term, what makes sense is typically uh, sort of re replacing inefficient processes rather than um, sort of genuine innovation in financial services. Yeah, I mean, what I, what I found is typically the stuff you want to build with blockchain is very often what's already built. It's just something you can make better, right? Like, so you just take existing systems, existing services in the financial, traditional finance, and then you just create a new version built with blockchain that's like faster and better and more easily accessible, something like that, right? So with, with that view, I really think that over the, like 20 years from now, what will happen is that to a certain extent, kind of the, the, um, the, the, the advanced part of finance and sort of the, the more centralized part of blockchain will have merged into this like single, just like technologically advanced finance, right? Like, and you just, where you just use the tools available to make the best products. But I also still do believe that there will be this true crypto asset class forever, right? That will include these like the, just the most, like the biggest and most obvious coins, right? I mean, Bitcoin, obviously, Ethereum, and kind of other systems that actually are real, like properly decentralized and properly have sort of a reason to exist as a, in, in this like, you know, non like self-sovereign state, right? Or like purely decentralized blockchain. Um, and ultimately, it's probably less than what people think. Like, it's not going to be everything that will be like that, right? And, and most of the traditional ICOs and all of this stuff, we're seeing so much stuff being done right now. A lot of that would actually just fall under traditional finance, I think. And it was, in the end, it's, it's mainly that that's going to grow and benefit the most from blockchain. And this new asset class kind of is just like a curious um, side effect in a way. I mean, of course, Bitcoin is the first one, but it's still that most of what we're seeing being made is really just traditional finance made better. Um, you guys raise an excellent point that there are different use cases for each cryptocurrency. And so they don't fall under one asset class per se, because there are different use cases that are going into it. But then the broader question then is, to the average non-technical user, how will they be interacting with it day to day? What are the implications of having these different use cases and having some of them fall under traditional finance and other, uh, others have different use cases? Yeah, so I very strongly believe that as much as possible, blockchain should be made totally invisible, right? Like crypto and blockchain and nobody wants to actually know about like how it works right or what it is they just want their bank to be cheap and fast and and i think that's how it's going to grow primarily right um there is of course there is this kind of a growing movement of of good ux uh, crypto wallets and this kind of stuff and they will definitely they will also they will become the new type of offering right there's also this hybrid like revolut for instance is like an interesting example of something that's like, I mean, I think that actually that's a really good example of what the future looks like, right? This, like, like ultimately, the, the idea of, like, get, putting users straight to the blockchain and kind of, like, have direct access into, like, unlimited potential of you can do whatever you want with smart contracts, that's, like, 99% of people are not going to want that, right? Mm -hmm. They'll want some simplified, something where the, the complicated and the kind of, like, the, the, the rough edges are, are hidden, and it's really just, like, you don't even have to, you know, something you don't have to think about. It just works. Yeah, I think as long as you have the requirement that everyone using the system needs to have the level of information security ability of a major bank, it is very difficult to drive adoption. And so the more we can do to make interfaces seamless, to make the on-ramp um, you know, much simpler, the more adoption will occur. Um, that's part of the reason why I think um, there's a greater role for actually digital fiat than you know those of us who've uh, kind of grown up in the industry, um, you know, originally believed. Because I think that stability, right to your point, um, is absolutely critical for folks. I think one of the um, one of the the features of cryptocurrency right now, which is really not great for consumption, very good for speculation, but not good for consumption, is just its extreme volatility. Right? It makes it pretty unspendable because you don't want to get paid in something that can drop by 50% tomorrow, and you don't want to spend something that might go up by 50% tomorrow. Uh, and so that's one thing uh, which I think is uh, a little bit problematic about crypto.
cryptocurrencies today when you're talking about consumer adoption. Uh, and then, you know, over and above that, if you are uh, trying to sort of buy and use on the internet at any really, uh, really any scale, it's actually sort of a very stressful consumer experience to think that this money could go up or down by 50% today or tomorrow, right? It actually makes it for a very bad consumer experience because people are inherently risk averse. And so people are going to feel, you know, sort of more strongly about losing the potential to lose money than gain money. Uh, and that means on balance, you're going to have kind of unhappy customers, consumers. And I think that's actually problematic for sort of broader adoption in the space. Yeah. And this is not a new problem, right? This right. is why well, many contracts are dollarized, even between nations that do not use dollars, simply because they're pricing in a exactly. stable reserve currency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Um, I want to continue tugging on the thread of broader adoption. Um, in like 2014, 2015, we increasingly heard, um, you know, uh, bank the unbanked. And now it's kind of, it seems to have dropped from the language. And I'm curious, do we still believe in this um, financial inclusion that this re financial revolution will increase that as well as privacy? Um, and what's the road to total financial inclusion and better privacy? No. Um, I think South America is a perfect example of of how like this bank the unbanked or how like when there is a need for financial services that aren't being met by the traditional system, crypto kind of steps in naturally through its its uh, lower barrier to entry. And I mean Venezuela is obviously the, the perfect example, right, of a country where people are just I mean they're they're buying and holding Bitcoin as like stable value, right, because it's still better than their own currency. Mm -hmm. Uh, Argentina is another example of a country that has pretty severe inflation, and uh, so we recently um, we recently got our stablecoin Dai, which is pegged to one dollar, integrated on the big exchanges in Argentina and South America, and it actually came. It, it was uh, it was news in like the largest national newspaper there, because it was like now you can get dollars like easily on the on the blockchain, and that's actually something everyone's like they're, they're waiting for that kind of stuff, right? Because they all try to get access to dollars, and, and, and these services just weren't there before. And now we're actually seeing, I mean, so we're seeing great adoption because there's a gap that, that the technology fills. And I think there are many other places in addition to South America and around the world, basically, where those conditions are, are similar and where we can also see these kind of like where it, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And, um, as, as the, the momentum shows, more and more will just step in and, and actually provide services to these people. Yeah, well, this is about trust, right? So if you have created a system by which you can actually guarantee that the person who owns this account is the person who controls the currency and they simply do not need to trust that a bank can get in their way or potentially a government can take their earnings from them, then it is enormously valuable in countries where there have been, you know, there's been a history of currency controls or there's been a history of asset seizures or all the things that you can, in principle, prevent by digitizing that asset. Um. So I think crypto is going to look pretty different um, in, you know, in different uh, economies and different political systems. Um, in a country like the United States, in a country like Finland, our everyday lives work pretty well. We have money that works. It's pretty much going to be worth the same tomorrow as it is today. And we also have governments and rule, uh, rule of law and institutions that work, right? Work for us uh, and work for society. Uh, and so I think in developed markets, uh, the likely you know, applications that are being built around blockchain are going to be sort of the financialization of additional sort of, uh, of, of, of insecurization of existing asset classes, right? So a classic example people talk about is taking real estate, putting it on a blockchain. So, you know, uh, you, there's less of a role for trust companies that, you know, take a pretty large fee in real estate transactions, just as one example. Um, I think that, you know, um, as uh, Rune and Eli were talking about, in developing countries, uh, because, you know, cryptocurrency and blockchain, it's not just sort of taking an economic uh, system, putting it into the digital world. It's really a governance system as well. It has a bigger role in, uh, in parts of the world where you know, money doesn't work very well and governance doesn't work very well. Uh, so I think it's going to look very different if you're sitting in Finland, if you're sitting in somewhere like Venezuela or you know, somewhere in between. 
Um, and, uh, and, and, that, and when I think about blockchain and sort of why it's so foundationally interesting, it's because it's not just a financial system, right? It's not just an economic system, but it's really sort of taking an economic system and really a political and a governance system and actually enabling that uh, to be, you know, to, to really come to life in a digital form. Um, the second part to that question is also the increase in privacy. Do you guys see that being a narrative that end users care for? And if not, um, what would it take, if anything, for them to begin caring? Is it even important to care about privacy? Yeah, my experience is that most people, unfortunately, don't care at all, right? And I mean, they just don't even, they just don't even care, right? Like, even if, they, if you try to talk to, or, like, provide options, just like, I mean, if you're putting all this stuff, if you're putting all your info on Facebook anyway, like Twitter and so on, why does it really matter, right? But again, in, in some countries, and, and also just there are some people, they, they do care or they, do, they have to care, right? Because maybe they're, the government is, could, could come after them for using like the type of money that they want to use or something like that, right? Um, so I guess the good news is that what we, I mean, there is, there's the technology that's able to actually meet this demand for privacy, right? There's the, there's just like zero knowledge proofs, kind of like the whole CK uh, snarks and stocks and all of this stuff. Um, and that's they're seeing a lot of traction. And actually, just interestingly enough, uh, recently, so our, again, our stablecoin dies. So this cryptocurrency that's worth $1 that's being adopted, for instance, in, in Venezuela and Argentina, uh, there was actually made a version of that that's anonymous. So that uses CK, uh, CK stocks to create this like anonymous version of the currency. So the people who do want privacy or do need it actually have the ability through the blockchain to get a level of privacy that was impossible beforehand. Could you guys track how many people are actually using the anonymity feature? <laughs> or what do the uh, statistics look Yeah, around? I mean, that's a, the thing, that's the thing about anonymity features in, in blockchain is typically yeah. if you actually use them, that by itself becomes a red flag. <laughs> but but um, in certain, <laughs> what, what I think can easily happen is that in certain areas where there is just a high risk environment where you got to stay anonymous, entire sort of pockets of ecosystems will pop up where everyone is using the anonymous versions of the currencies. And then, of course, there'll be like it does create fungibility issues and kind of like interoperability issues when you try to, to move from some, a regime like that into a KYC more standard financial regime. And, but, and that's just like the inefficiency caused by, I guess, the repressive governments in the first place. Yeah. Um, I think yeah. we, need, uh, we need to sort of broaden the narrative around privacy to really be an issue of just security. Because right now, when people think about cryptocurrency, you know, this is maybe from the origins of the industry when Bitcoin kind of, you know, unfortunately, its first use case was really a Silk Road and basically buying drugs on the internet. And it sort of has, it's constantly had that pallor and shadow of, well, you know, privacy equals criminality. But that's not actually the case, right? We should think about privacy really as security. Uh, and, you know, if you think about your, your bank account in the, in the physical world, uh, you have a default private situation. Uh, you know, it, you don't have every transaction being broadcast. You don't have sort of like Venmo for your bank account, right? Most people don't want that. And there's a reason why you don't want that, and that's fine, and that's okay. You want to have sort of selective information rights uh, as to what you're doing with your money. Uh, and so I think that that's equally important in a cryptocurrency world um, because something like Bitcoin uh, is pseudonymous, but with the right data set, you can actually de-anonymize a lot of that. And that's just not something that you know, most people want to have with their have with their wealth or bank account for, for obvious reasons. Uh, and so to me, I really think about privacy as an important feature, um, which is not just for you know, people who want to do dark market and sort of you know, bad things with cryptocurrency, but just as a necessary sort of part of having a healthy financial system. And sort of being a feature of security rather than just sort of, you know, uh, uh, you know a cover for, for things you don't want people to know about. Well, the question is really privacy from whom, right? So we used to have private bank accounts not that long ago. The entire financial system was chained circa 2000 to eliminate almost all forms of um, accounts opened without identification, right? So... You know, there used to be the old Swiss numbered accounts. There were all sorts of things where there was a cultural expectation of anonymity around the opening of the account, and we eliminated almost all of those from the electronic uh, banking system. And the reason we did that is because the countries that had a strong interest in preventing illicit transfers more or less enforced 
these rules on the global exchange systems and they filter down to the local banks. So why do we have problems with Bitcoin? Well, it's just opening a bank account without a name associated. You know, when you wire money from a regular bank account to another, the bank is attesting that the owner of that account is the person whose name they're transmitting. And we just don't have that now. So I think if you expect millions of people to use um, these systems for everyday purposes, there will be a solution that is found because the existing uh, overstrain infrastructure is very valuable to the countries that created it. And there's a very strong disincentive to just roll back the clock to 1985 for all these countries. Absolutely. I like the emphasis on changing the narrative so it's more focused around security and information security as opposed to strictly privacy, which does have this shadow tethered to it. Um, kind of continuing along the same line, um, we do know that people think cryptocurrencies are generally used by um, people that are doing drug deals or funding terrorist activities or other unsavory um, interests. So when you want to debunk that stereotype or you want to debunk that narrative, what are exciting projects or use cases you guys specifically refer to um, that paint a different picture? Well, I think one really obvious one, I mean, actually, you, were, you came with a, an example earlier, right? Like people being paid micropayments and uh, just like in general, there's like more free access to, to transactions around smaller services. Um, I think another really cool example of, of what's being done right now is remittance, right? So you're actually seeing startups uh, utilizing crypto trading and arbitrage across different markets to, to disrupt remittance and, and actually end up as like the infrastructure and backbone for larger remittance companies to run on top of because it's just a really efficient way to move money. And then my favorite subject uh, or like one of my, my, one of my favorite subjects of what's going to be really like what crypto is really going to improve is trade finance. Uh, and there's, there's already some projects, there's already some, uh, some re real world results being seen, but it's, it's still like the next wave that's coming with um, just like multiple projects across the world all trying to build trade finance solutions. And we have our own as well at Maker. So we've, we've partnered with TradeShift, which is a major uh, supply chain platform. And, um, and trade finance is just like it's a huge sort of it's not really well known, but it's like a massive market. And it's one of the, the places where if you just create better infrastructure, we put more money into it, we will, we will change the world economy for, for better for small businesses. And then, of course, there's the unbanked again, right? And, and that whole story. But, but yeah, in the, in the developed world, there's certainly also a ton of use cases that I'm sure are already at this point way beyond anything we're seeing with the, with, with the usage of dark markets. Yeah, I do think it's interesting, though, that when you create a mechanism by which you can potentially both pay and um, enforce the rules for that payment to anyone, you are, in theory, creating a system by which you can circumvent weak jurisdictions or weak enforcement of contract law. So there are billions of people in the world who are almost unemployable in most circumstances because you simply cannot operate effectively in the country, right? I can't hire 100,000 people in North Korea or in Zimbabwe or in many other countries where I would have no mechanism by which I could enforce any disputes and they would equally have no mechanism by which they could pursue me effectively if we had a disagreement. But if we create uh, systems by which we can transmit money and the description of what it is that you are doing and then have ideally mechanical enforcement of those rules um, or mechanical evaluation of the metrics by which the funds are being dispersed, in principle, you should be able to increase prosperity in countries where today there is no other option. So. Um, well, when I think about adoption, um, I think you've got to come up with, first and foremost, just experiments, uh, experiences which are really compelling and substantially better than the current alternative. Uh, and so, you know, one of the probably most uh, sort of widely adopted uh, kind of crypto integrated applications out there is Brave, the browser, right? Uh, now, when you download it, you don't have to know anything about crypto and completely ignore that element of it. First and foremost, it's just a really fantastic browser, 
super fast, blocks all of your ads, um, doesn't you know suck up your bandwidth, and you know once that hooks a number of people, then they're going to you know uh, potentially figure out how to integrate cryptocurrency into the experience. Uh, but first and foremost. What we need to use every day is a really fantastic browser, both on your internet, uh, uh, on your computer, as well as your phone, and it accomplishes that without sort of leading with cryptocurrency first, which I think is something that, um, you know, as cryptocurrency aficionados, we really like, but the major majority of people actually would prefer not to have anything to do with. Absolutely. So. Thank you. All right. Well, um, we're out of time. Thank you guys so much for this discussion. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Cool. Thanks.